You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about a good reason for living. Last month, we told the story of one of the five men in Ecuador who gave their lives in attempting to reach a tribe of Indians called the Alcas. I wanted to read you the story as seen from the standpoint of a Life magazine photographer by the name of Cornell Kappa. Cornell was asked to go to Ecuador as soon as the word had reached New York that five American men were missing. Nobody knew whether the men were dead or alive, and so Cornell immediately hopped the first plane that he could, came to Ecuador, and spent several days until the bodies were discovered. The Air Force Rescue Service from Panama had come down to attempt to rescue these men, and this is Cornell's story as he told it later on. The Air Force Rescue Service's helicopter landed, and I jumped out just as the rescue party was taking the last body to a common grave. The atmosphere was fantastic. Nervous hands fingered triggers and eyes were trained on the oppressive wall of jungle. I did not have to ask why. A storm came on with tropical suddenness. Rain fell in buckets. Dim figures moved through an eerie light. Grim and weary missionaries looked for the last time at their friends, whose bodies they could no longer identify. One of them said, It's better this way. I feel less miserable. There followed our homeward trek through Alca territory. The canoes, overloaded, leaked at the slightest movement, and I sat like a protective mother hen, shielding my cameras from the water. Major Malcolm Nuremberg, an American Air Force attaché from Quito, led the party, with his carbine poised at all times out of the danger area. At the missionary base of Shalmera, five women were waiting for our return. Through radio communication, they knew that all was lost, but they wanted to be told in minute detail everything that had happened. Dr. Art Johnston, who was in the rescue party, spared them nothing as he faced them in the kitchen of Nate Saint's home. Their faces were drawn and gaunt, but there were no complaints, no self-pity. I flew back to New York, carrying with me the pictures of Operation Alka taken by Nate Saint. Among them was the last strip of film developed out of his camera that had been found in the river. It showed the three Alkas of this hitherto unphotographed tribe. The men's diaries gave many details of the missionary contact with them, but the hopes of ever finding out exactly what had occurred on the beach and why the seemingly friendly contact had turned into massacre were slim indeed. The answer lay buried deep in the jungle with the unreachable Alcas. For me, at least, Cornell's story goes on, the story seemed to have come to an end. The widows believed that their husband's death was not the meaningless tragedy it appeared to many. No thoughts of revenge crossed their minds. On the contrary, they felt with an increased sense of urgency the need to bring their message of love and redemption to the Alcas. During the following year, I learned of the quiet determination with which the widows continued their work in the missionary field in Ecuador. Marge Saint and Mary Lou McCulley, with three children each, moved to Quito to work in missionary headquarters. Elizabeth Elliot and Barbara Udarian stayed in the jungle with their small families, working among the Quechua and Hibero Indians. I decided to visit them again and try to understand the urge that lay behind their extraordinary dedication. The peace of soul, the mental and physical security shown by all those I had visited, defied my comprehension. They never stopped praying and hoping that one day the Alcas might make their first hesitant steps to the outside world. I visited Elizabeth Elliot at the Quechua Mission Station of Shandia. It was strange to see this gaunt, tall, blonde American woman walk through the jungle, often shoeless because it was easier that way, but with a wary eye for poisonous snakes. With her, also barefoot, went her daughter Valerie, a tiny ethereal creature who seemed to walk not on the earth, but slightly above it. Elizabeth taught at the school that Jim and Pete Fleming had established, did medical work and continued translating parts of the Bible into the Quechua tongue. She was firm on everything that involved her faith, Valerie, and herself. 
Where I go, Valerie goes. I believe the Lord expects me to be as careful as possible about Valerie's health in our home, but when I accept the hospitality from Indians, I trust the Lord to take care of the results. I feel it's more important for me and Valerie to share the Indian life than to cut ourselves off from them in order to preserve our health. I wondered how Elizabeth could reconcile Jim's death at the hands of the Alcas and the Lord's apparent failure to protect him from them. Her answer came back without hesitation. I prayed for the protection of Jim, that is, physical protection. The answer the Lord gave transcended what I had in mind. He gave protection from disobedience, and through Jim's death accomplished results the magnitude of which only eternity can show. I left Shandia a bit shaken and kept on hearing Elizabeth's parting words. It gives me a much more personal desire to reach the Alcas. The fact that Jesus Christ died for all makes me interested in the salvation of all, but the fact that Jim loved and died for the Alcas intensifies my love for them. That's the end of Cornell Kappa's account of what he saw when he came to Ecuador to cover the story for Life magazine. Incidentally, I do keep up with Cornell Kappa. I see him every now and then. About a year ago, we visited him again in New York. He's still a photographer. He's the director of the International Museum of Photography on Fifth Avenue. And I don't think he's ever quite been able to get out of his mind that missionary story. He had never heard of missionaries before, could not imagine what five American men would be doing among a tribe of savages unless they were anthropologists, so the story held all kinds of interest for him. As he says, I went back to work on my station called Shandia, the place where Jim and I had been working together, and I followed that piece of advice from an old English parsonage do the next thing. I'm told that that's the motto that's carved, I think, over the door of an English parsonage down by the sea. I went back to do the next thing. There was plenty to do, believe me. I prayed at that time a prayer that seemed rather absurd at the time. I said, Lord, if there's anything that you want me to do about the Alka Indians, I'm available. Supposing that it was a very safe prayer. Ever prayed any prayers like that that you really had no intention that God should answer? Well, I guess that's really the way I was praying. I thought, I belong to him, I'm his servant, I'm a missionary, maybe he wants me to go to the Alcas, but it's very doubtful. But anyway, Lord, here I am if there's something you want me to do. And Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. I don't think he meant don't plan your grocery list, don't make provision for your children, don't buy insurance. But what I do think is pretty clear in the passage is that Jesus meant do not worry. Don't be anxious about anything, and don't take on the burdens of tomorrow. Those are really none of your business. If you take on tomorrow's burdens, you won't have strength enough to carry out the work that I have assigned you for today. That's what I thought God was saying to me, so I stuck to the practical and the immediate, the real reasons for my missionary work. The real reasons for my missionary work were the real reasons for my living at all. What do you live for? Whose are you? What is the real reason that you're doing the work that you are doing today? Is it money? Is it because there's nothing else to do? Is it boredom? Is it fun? The real reason for living ought to be a good reason for dying. I knew whose I was. I was not my own. I belonged to God. He had paid a price for me, the price of his own blood. I am not my own. I am bought with a price. So my reason for living is for him, to do his will, to learn to know him. My reason for missionary work was obedience. And so, that's why I went back to Shandia. 
I was not there to do my own thing. I was there to do his thing, and it hadn't changed. God had called me to be a missionary before I ever married Jim Elliott, so nothing had changed as far as my vocation and my calling was concerned. The verse that I had often quoted to people who asked why those five men had gone into savage territory was 1 John 2.17. The world and all its passionate desires will one day disappear, but the man who is following the will of God is part of the permanent and cannot die. If obedience is a good reason for dying, it's certainly a good reason for living. And if your reason for living is not worth dying for, may I suggest that it really isn't worth living for. You need to revise your reason. When Amy Carmichael, an Irish missionary to India, established a small group of Indian sisters called the Sisters of the Common Life, this was what she wrote for their rule. It was not a convent. It was not a group of people quite like Catholic nuns or monks, but I'm sure she took her cues from some of the things that she had read, written by monks and nuns about their common life. Their vow was this, Whatsoever thou sayest unto me, by thy grace I will do it. Their constraint, thy love, O Christ my Lord. Their confidence, thou art able to keep that which I have committed unto thee. Their joy, to do thy will, O God. Their discipline, that which I would not choose, but which thy love appoints. May God help us to have a good reason for living, which is also a good reason for dying. Gateway to Joy 119, a good reason for living. <laughs> 